Welcome back to GA Fan TV. My name is Aaron. I'm delighted to be joined here by former Carlo senior footballer Daniel St. Ledger to preview the Carlo footballers for the upcoming 2023 inter county season. We're going to be looking back at Carlo last year, previewing them this year as well, discussing everything else in between and everything else. Uh, Daniel, how's things with yourself? You're keeping well? How are you, Aaron? Yeah, not too bad at all. Not too bad. That, uh, get to that time of season now where county players are shaping up. They've had their few weeks off and it's uh, back, to, back to the front of the pitch. 100%. 100%. Yeah, you excited for another inter county season supporting Carlo? I know maybe it's maybe last year wasn't the best year, maybe supporting Carlo or whatever. But I mean, generally speaking, you know, how, how are you kind of looking forward to, to next year and everything else? Yeah, I, I think there's probably um I think there's an acceptance in Carlo at the moment that we have a particularly young group. And um I, I think even though last year what like by, by no means was fantastic, but I think they they were glad to to kind of blood a couple of these like we've we've a huge amount of 18, 19, 20 year olds, you know, and getting they're getting serious experience at division four kind of competitive levels. So um yeah, I think there's an acceptance that those guys are gonna take a couple of years to bed in. So it's it's you're kind of tentatively looking forward to it and you're just hoping there's a little bit of progress made from from last year. Did a good win over Tipperary in the um in the Talton Cup. So you're kind of hoping there's a bit of they've learned a little bit from last year. But it's definitely it's 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 a stepping stone process for Carlo at the moment, you know. Yeah, I was going to say that to you as well. It does seem like maybe that sort of era of Carlo Roizen that was kind of very much the the thing, obviously, when you were playing and you had Paul Broderick playing and a few other lads. Like It does kind of seem like that era has probably moved away and it's now sort of like a, a new generation of Carlo footballers that are sort of taking the helm now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it had to get that way as well. Like, I mean, it was, you know, <laughs> we, a few of us needed to be shipped on and moved out, you know, and, and there's probably the same cohort had been there for maybe seven or eight years, you know. So, um, like, there's still, there's still one or two hanging around or hanging around still. I know Dara Foley's still floating in there and a couple of others, but it is, it, you know, you need your new generation. You need your, your Jordan Morrissey's and Dara Bryant's, these kind of fellas to kind of take on the mantle of the, as, as a senior players, you know. So, um, and and that's a that's a learning curve for them as well, even you know, because it's going from maybe a young player being in a squad of elder members to all of a sudden now being the leader. You know, it's, it's a different kind of uh, it's a different kind of a requirement. But um, yeah, it's, it is it's good for those lads that they're that they're getting that exposure as well because it's it's necessary. You know, hundred percent. Yeah, and what's it been like for yourself? Obviously, watching on from the from the sidelines. I know I chat to you about a year ago and everything else we're sort of running through your time obviously playing for for carlo and everything else so what's it been like sort of watching on the sidelines again sort of last year and i suppose absorbing everything yeah it's been uh, it's kind of it's nearly the, the panel has changed so much I, some of the lads i wouldn't even i wouldn't even know you know there's some 18 and 19 year olds there that i'd be texting a few of the lads that are selling the panel and going where's this fella from or what's you know what, what's he about you know so it's it's a whole it's a massively different squad um my, my own time is busy enough and i'm managing sylvester's up here so i kind of i'm crossing over an awful lot that i i, I don't see a whole lot of carlo in the flesh I've only, i'm only getting the the youtube clips afterwards you know from a few of the boys but it's um it, it last year was hard in a sense like to watch it and i was just when i knew we were coming on to have a chat i was looking at some of the bits and pieces from last year and um i was looking at scoring differences and stuff like that and, and they conceded 134 uh, scores last year you know which is the highest by 32 points in the division you know so it was a real slog kind of watching those watching some of those trimmings come in you know and, and again as i said to you at the very outset that's all part of the learning curve. Like God knows, I was on the I was on the end of plenty of them as well. But it's a tough place to be for those young lads. You, you, you learn very quickly, you know. Yeah, because I suppose at the start year, you obviously had Paul Broderick's retirement as well, and he's obviously been probably one of the the standout names for Carlo. When you do think back to that era under Turlock O'Brien and everything else, obviously him retiring and stepping away. Like imagine that sort of a a big sort of blow for Carlo but as you said at the same time probably great to see you know younger lads and, and new players sort of stepping in yeah absolutely and and that can be it's very hard I think from from a player's point of view when you're in the here and now you, all you want to do is win all you want to do is is get promoted you want you, you, can't, you know, it's hard to look at the bigger picture you know but that's that's probably where like a, a good management team can see two or three year, years down the line so there's an acceptance that we just have to try and keep things afloat keep the mood in the camp really really good keep giving the lads the principles that they need both on the field off the field 
keep that conditioning up like i mean because you know you look at some of even some of the other division four teams at the moment like physically there's some massively massively well conditioned teams there and that's probably something that i, I know for a fact here in Ireland, the strength and conditioner is really focused in on these lads because you're, you're at a growth age at 19 20 so it takes maybe three or four years of to get that base level of conditioning into you so um yeah it, it's look I, i'd be you know, performance. I think is what they have to look for this year more so than going out and say we need to we need to hit twelve points. They need to be looking to be competitive in every single game. And if if you get that, if you can get that start, that's a massive base. You know. Yeah, like and and one player that did catch the eye anyway for myself anyway from a from a neutral point of view. Obviously, I didn't really get to see Carlo play too much last year. Uh, obviously, you know, watching the game against Tipperary and everything else. But Colm Hutton looks like a. A very very good footballer from what i seen like he was kind of racking up the score sort of week in week out so i suppose it's good that you're kind of finding him and sort of other new additions sort of coming around the panel yeah absolutely and <clears throat> colin would have been playing in ballymont for a couple of years as well and he's he, he was in on the panel i think in 2019 was his first year so he has been around for a little bit of time as well you know so it's kind of and, and that kind of goes back to the point that it does take time to get used to get used to even just the routine of you know, you might have three gyms a week and you two, two two pitch sessions and a league game on a Sunday. Like, that takes a fair bit of getting used to, you know. So that probably might have slowed his progress a small bit, but you can start to see it bearing fruit. Like, he's worked hard to get in there. And, you know, like we're talking about scoring forwards, I mean, they're almost a, a dying breed, you know, these days. It's it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Like, every every team is looking for that inside forward, but with a knack to score because there, you can see that the program, the development squads are turning out these big, strong athletes who can play to a game plan perfectly. But the the little, you know, the I won't say off the cuff, but that natural score, you know, same in soccer, you know, everyone wants to be a, a, a number ten playing in the playing in the pocket. Now there's very few traditional Olivia Giroud types up front, you know. So Colin is a little bit of that, like he's just a finisher. So it's um, it'll be interesting to see can he can he kind of put himself to the forefront with a couple of other lads in winter. Let's say you're playing end of January, February, March against really well organized defensive setups you know because that takes that takes a lot of patience as well so it'll be um yeah there's some there's some really good young lads coming through and uh, last year jamie clark another fellow that's been on the panel since got 2017 or 18 he had a fantastic year last year physically is after developing an awful lot so um yeah as i said these these young guys are starting to take on the mantle a bit which is brilliant yeah and i suppose from a, a Niall carew point of view obviously since he obviously took charge of the Carlo footballers it's been I suppose a, a tricky tricky job to inherit obviously as you've said like kind of going from one era of players to another and as you said like a lot of time is obviously needed there a lot of transition transitionary period so what have you sort of made of his helm as manager so far and obviously it looks well he's going to be the man sort of going into 2023 as well so yeah what are your yeah. sort of thoughts on that um, yeah, look, in fairness, it, it's an incredibly hard job. Like such, like when you're when you're going, as you say, going through that transition is is it's really hard because the results just won't come immediately, and and supporters and even players expect that, even though it mightn't necessarily be the most realistic thing. But like he added Ronan Joyce to the backroom team last year from, uh, from Nace, and he he's got like any of the boys I've talked to, they have really really good time for him. His coaching is excellent, and they really enjoy what what he's bringing. And Eamon Callan from Nace as well is in as a performance coach now. I'd be curious to see what if that actually morphs into something on the field rather than something off the field. I know there's much maligned performance coach. What what are they actually what is the actual purpose? But I'd be inclined to say a guy with that experience, get him on the pitch, get him integrating with the players, get put him into scenarios, whether it's it's taking a group of forwards, midfielders, whatever it is, you know, he has a huge base of knowledge. So in fairness tonight, he has surrounded himself with some good guys, you know, which is which is really important. And all the, the mood for coming from everyone seems to be things are really happy you know so I, I think when you have a settled camp and a happy camp that is a very good base to be starting from yeah 100 percent. like and i suppose like as you said kind of keeping the keeping the same man in charge like i think sometimes maybe a lot of fans and everything else sort of fall into maybe a bit of a soccer mentality sometimes of chopping and changing and making changes and everything else and to be fair i think majority of people in carlo like yourself what you said i think very much recognize that there is a building period here and there's no point making drastic changes or, or anything sort of of that nature yeah absolutely and 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 i think that that's probably this year is a big year for him in that sense because he's had an old covid had a covid year which was interrupted he's had last year so you'd be you'd be hoping to see a couple of those building blocks start to come in, into place and 
the big one for me would be that would be that that scoring rate. You know, I mean, it, it's you you have to not that has to be your first port of call. Like it's I was again just I got down a wormhole online of looking at bits and pieces over the years, and I think in since twenty seventeen. Uh, there's been not not one team has got promoted that has had over a hundred points against. So you're you're talking about under under 12, 13 points a game is what teams that are getting promoted are conceding. And I think that has to be your base level for no matter what you're scoring, you know, defending is a lot more predictable than your forward play. Sometimes your forward play can have many other facets that could stop it. Like there could be conditions, there could be, as I said, 14 men behind the ball, there could be all sorts of things, but your defending is the one thing that you can start with. And it's, that would be interesting to see if that's kind of addressed. And again, I wouldn't be putting that on six defenders. That's a mindset coming from, 15 back you know and and even that defensive stuff can come from how you approach your kickouts or how you approach the opposition kickouts and um, last year they, they in the Tipperary game especially they, they kind of figured out that they wouldn't have a massively big team traditionally traditional big midfielders that you could say right we're going for an aggressive 4-4-3 press here they, they had they have smaller fellas more athletic fellas quicker fellas and they kind of realized that coming towards the end of the year and they they dropped off kickouts a little bit more um which again might seem as a negative to as, as, as a negative tactic but the reality is you have to play with the players you have and they had great success in the temporary game doing that you know um then you're looking at that, that when you put the shoe on the other foot they have to have a really set in stone plan for their own kickouts because of that reason they haven't got a brendan murphy who you can you know six foot six you can just bang it down the middle to it's, it's an easy win worst case scenario you're getting a break those kind of players don't exist, you know. I know Jordan Morrissey, Dara Foley be around the middle, but they're they're still maybe only six foot one, six foot two. They're not that traditional kind of powerhouse around the middle. So that those two aspects, I'd be really curious to see. Have they got something set in stone on on their kickout, and have they got something set in stone defensively? Because without those two, without those two bits, you know, it's going to be very hard to see them getting footholds in games. Yeah, because it, it does obviously seem to be a huge sort of shift from obviously yourself when you were playing, obviously under Turlock O'Brien, Stevie Poacher and everything else where it probably was a lot more defensive based where under Noel Carew it definitely seems to be almost a complete shift in sort of attack. Like, do you think maybe that's sort of something done on purpose maybe like in, in terms of maybe trying to shift away from like a defensive sort of football and mindset or, or what do you reckon? Yeah, a hundred percent, and and it's you know sometimes the narrative is funny, and like if you can you can get out ahead of these things sometimes. And I remember Niall in his first, I think one of his first interviews with the Carlo Nationals, he was saying we we're going to be front foot football, you know, and that's like absolutely grand. But it was um, you know you have to you have to have put the pieces in place before you get on the front foot. Uh, you know you have to earn the right to get on the front foot, and that does start with defending. And I know like our our time probably finished up on a on a kind of. I won't say a sour note, but there was there was that perception that we were incredibly defensive, which kind of came from our games that we would have played, let's say, against teams that would have been a good step above us, you know. Um, you know, you're talking about the, the Dublin game, the Monaghan game, even one of those leash the leash Leinster semi-final was 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 cagey, you know. But um he he definitely set his stall out to do the opposite of what was there previously. And that is fantastic, but at the end of the day, every team has to defend. Every team has to attack. It's it's the bottom line, and to get that balance, I think, is really important. And and definitely, the era before sometimes didn't quite strike it. And as we can see from the figures last year, it wasn't quite struck either. Yeah, like, and I suppose like there's diff different ways of playing. Obviously, there's no sort of right way of playing. Like I think different different styles make fights, and that's what makes sport kind of interesting a lot of the time. But in terms of that generation of players, like you sort of played with, like obviously even when I look back through history and everything else, there haven't been too many sort of Carlo teams that have you know threatened to make a Leinster final or have sort of rose up through the leagues. Like, do you think that sort of era that you sort of played for maybe was sort of like a once off? For Carlo, or do you think maybe there's a another breed of players coming through that might maybe achieve similar or come closest? Or what do you reckon? Yeah, well, again, if you look, if we look at if we look go down to minor under seventeen over the last maybe maybe seven or eight years, we haven't threatened at any of those age groups. Similarly, with under twenty, under twenty one, there's been no threat. And um, that team that we had was more or less made up of the minor team that got Leinster final in twenty thousand seven. You know, so there was a backbone. There was a bit of uh, there was a bit of history there, whereas I don't see that at the moment, to be perfectly honest. Um, but in saying that, I don't see why any team couldn't be competitive. And and this is where the 
the trade-off comes for Carlo in general because because of our let's say lack of tradition underage because of even the split with the hurling and football we have to cut our cloth to measure and we just don't have the players to to go out and be swashbuckling and people don't particularly like to hear that and I don't know if there's an awareness of it totally when you but when you take a step back and look at what we have and what other teams have absolutely there you know you don't need to be completely negative about it but there has to be an awareness of maybe maybe we need to do things slightly differently to be consistently competitive so yes there is possibilities there of a team if they were totally rigidly organized and um had a very high base of condition and even a couple of good free takers that can get you that can get you a, a good bit of the way and can make you very competitive um you know after that it's it's in the lap of the gods a little bit because as i said there is nothing we can't base anything off what we've seen from carlo underage teams for the last got a decade nearly yeah like and i suppose i was going to mention that as well like in, in terms of the the lack of sort of maybe players coming through at underage level like do you think that is just down to i suppose a lack of resources really i suppose it's it's a very small county it's, it's certainly not got the same resources and everything else as some other counties so would you kind of put it down to that do you think or, or what do you reckon yeah, it's like I, I'd be kind of slow to blame the the resources too much. It, it definitely there is the, the split with the hurling and football is is very very tricky. Like and and I'm even I'm even looking at like the fixtures came out today and I'm looking at the the crossover. Like you know you've got Sligo and Leitrim. I know they play a bit of hurling as well, but the main football the main sport is football. You know it is it is the big sport there. And um, like Wicklow, yes they have hurling, but football is predominant and Wicklow is a massive county as well. Um, like Waterford and Wexford, yes, there's a crossover there, and we'd always be competitive with those two counties. So I don't think there's any coincidence. But I, I think the like we're losing probably the guts of like maybe ten or twelve players who are who are playing on Ireland County panels, who in another world could easily be adding to the Carlow football panel, and probably vice versa as well. You know, but um, I think that's definitely an issue. Um, <sighs> Outside of that, like I mean, there there has been massive money pumped into the Carlo Colts, um, getting kids out, getting them playing. There's been there's been huge effort at that level, but we haven't seen any rewards for it. Um, being blunt again, like there hasn't, nothing has came from it, and we're probably playing catch up. Like where yes, it's fantastic now we have our development set up in place, but every county's every county most counties have had that for the last. 10, 15 years, most successful ones anyway. So you're always on the race to catch up a little bit. So, um, yeah, from, from the underage point of view, I think you'd be hoping for a bit of a, a free generation that might come along just to just just to kind of, if you got seven or eight players from a group of minors or something like that. But at this point in time, I, I wouldn't be so sure. Yeah, like, and, and what do you think maybe needs to be done in, in sort of that case? Like, obviously you were mentioning there some of the, the programs and everything else that's going on do you think it's just sort of more along them lines sort of promotion in schools and everything else or, or what do you think yes schools is probably extremely sorry it is extremely important and i remember carlos cbs got to an all ireland b final um god it might have been i think it was jordan morris he would have been a fifth year so he'd have been with 16 so that could have been eight or nine years ago you know and even the fact of having to go back to 2015 or 16 to talk about a successful carlos schools team is probably saying an awful lot in itself you know but um yeah, I think I think it start. It probably does start in the schools. It starts with the people in the schools. Um, the club scene in Carlo is dying a bit of a death at the moment, and that's from senior down. Um, we're seeing a whole host of clubs who are barely intermediate and probably could be junior. Um, our senior championship is extremely one-sided, shall I say? There's you know, you've got an Aerog, Pal Raffili kind of trio. I know Tin Ryland got there this year, but that was a bit new for them. But I, I think there something needs to be looked at with the amount of kind of junior and intermediate clubs we have in Carlo and, and some kind of an amalgamation in some capacity because at the moment the coaching isn't there, let's say in, in, in the small rural clubs, you're you're just not getting that um you're not getting that buy-in from players because Carlo Championship is run off in a six week gap. So it's almost a, a tournament game. If you're not playing county football. And, you know, Carlo League is non-promotion, non-relegation. You might only have three or four games in between March and May. Like, that doesn't that, that doesn't breed footballers. Like, where, where do you get your players? Like, and again, just to cross over, I know we're not comparing similar things, but like with, with Sylvester's this year, we have 15 league games and you have four or five championship games. And even lads that aren't involved with county teams or have ever been involved with county teams 
are all buying into S and C programs. They're all getting twenty four or five games throughout the year. So, but if an off on an off chance you get a player who has a fantastic year, he's ready made to go into a setup. Whereas if you're looking at a Carlo player, they'll probably unless they're extremely self motivated themselves, they'll have had no. They'll probably have had no buy into S and C at all ever any major S and C. And then if you're coming into a county team, you're, you're you've been playing senior club championship that hasn't necessarily been competitive, and you can get away with things you just can't at county level. It's a fantastic picture at the moment, but it it, it is a, it is a massive talking point at home, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, like I completely do get your point. Like, and I think it's. I suppose it is very tricky at times trying to trying to grow grow the sport in a lot of the so called sort of weaker counties. Um, I suppose obviously there was a tournament that was I suppose created for a lot of the the sort of division three and four sides. Obviously in the in the Talchian Cup and Carlo delivered a huge victory last year against Tipperary. Like what were your thoughts on that victory? Like it was definitely a result that caught a lot of people by surprise when you look at a side like Tipperary who were once their champions only a couple of years ago. I know they went down to Division 4, but they were promoted. And I think a lot of people looked at them as maybe a sort of dark horse for the Talchian Cup. Mm -hmm. So what were your thoughts on, on that victory? Yeah, and, and it's funny. Um, I, I kind of, from the outside looking, I would have been thinking the same. And I was chatting to a few of the lads afterwards. And, and they were actually quietly confident after playing them in the league. They kind of thought there, there was there was a chance here. If they, if they got set up properly, there was a chance to be competitive. And, and so it, it turned out. Um, but I, again, it, 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 was, it was a classic one-off thing that we kind of have a habit of doing in Carlo sometimes where we get a good day and that's it it wasn't based off uh, consistency of performance as such and, and again I, I'm not that's not a criticism it just comes from so many new lads and so much change but um, I, I think it was a good starting point and I think it gave it gave a lot of those young guys some real confidence and kind of it gave them a little kind of a, a kick going into next year that okay if we do if we can get our, our performance to be consistent our performances to be consistent we have a chance of competing with most teams and from that point of view it's very it's important psychologically because um in in my history or my kind of uh time with carlo the the confidence is extremely brittle extremely brittle and and when things you know when you come to the first two league games and, and you're basically treating these league games as championship games for example you you have everything put in over christmas is for this start in the league you've talked about getting promoted you've talked about the the 12 point you know that's the mark you want to hit and if you lose your first game as a team that's has a historic uh, losing tradition that's that's massively hard to retain that to, to, to get back that confidence so it will have done it will have done wonders for them coming into this year but um as regards the talton cup like you can. I, th I still think that they're a long way off that, and I, I don't think the Talton Cup even goes far enough. I, I think there's room for probably three cups, you know, uh, like you do with club, junior, intermediate, and senior, you know. And as a player, if I'd heard that, I'd have been saying, "No, go ahead, <laughs> leave it the way it is." But standing back and looking at it, I, I think that's probably where it could be. Um, Carlo could get some benefit because I'm not sure will they ever be at the level to get up past Division Three. Um, which would be winning your, which would be technically winning your, winning your Talton Cup as such, you know. So, yeah, it's. I don't think. I don't think it goes far enough for two competitions. Probably a third one's necessary because that Westmead team that won and, and Westmead and Cavan, like they were, they were high quality teams, you know. With as a, as I was talking about earlier, like the level of SNC they have, the, the the experience some of those guys have it was was huge, you know. So it's um, there still is a massive divergence, I think. Yeah, like, and I think the last time I was speaking to you, I was asking you about the Talchin Cup, and I know you weren't the biggest fan, obviously, back then in terms of it sort of being set up and everything else. Like, what are your thoughts now, having watched the back and having watched the first year? Like, would you still be sort of against the idea behind it, or like, what would be your kind of thought process? Um, well, I, I'll put it this way they, they did put an effort into marketing it. I thought it was sorry, marketing is probably the wrong word, but. The fact that the, the games were live, I think, was was a massive help. I have to say the like you're looking at. I know the, the All Stars were out for it there a couple of weeks ago. There wasn't a massive razzmatazz around, but it, again, it's a nice thing for players and their families to have. I think. Um, I, I still don't think the Talton Cup did any benefits for teams like Carlo. I mean, it was the exact same as a qualifier. It was had a good win in the qualifiers, still lost their next round. So, you know, did, did it benefit? Did it benefit them massively? Probably not. Being realistic. But as regards teams like maybe a little bit higher up the food chain, Westmead will definitely benefit from that last year, I think, you know. Um, 
but then you're going into a bigger conversation what's going to happen to Westmead next year when they're in the real thing are they at that level either you know so I, I, I don't know I, I, I don't think you're ever going to completely fix the problems that are there I think I think three competitions might go a little bit further too because it gives a really realistic goal for the Carlos, Waterfords, Wexfords, those kind of teams to, to, to hit, you know. And, and confidence momentum is a massive thing. Like if, if they could get if they could get a couple of wins at your junior level, let's say, that would do wonders for you going into the following year. Like it's so my 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 thoughts probably have changed a little bit because I kind of there's a small bit more trust in, in the GA than there was last year from from our whenever we were talking last, but um, I still don't think it actually altered Carlo's year in any capacity. Do you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I do get what you mean. Like, and, and in terms of Carlo football in general, like obviously we were speaking about underage there. Like, is there any kind of players you think that maybe have caught the eye that maybe could come into the panel next year? In, in your opinion? <sighs> to be honest, every, anyone that's there that has the has the ability to be there probably is. To be fair, um. Like yes, some of the older lads are still standing out in club championship games. That, but again, you're going back to a bygone era like that. That they probably want to move away from. So, like if if you I saw a couple of club games this year and like the quality isn't amazing. Um, Pal were probably by far, in fairness, I'm sorry, they were the best team in the county, obviously, but they they, they probably have the most to offer and they have quite a number of lads in with Carlo at the moment, which is which is great to see, but. No, I, I don't think. I think anyone that has even an inkling of playing has been either asked and refused or is in there already. So it's, I suppose, in a sense, that's a good thing that, that Niall has managed to get everyone he needs or everyone he wants into the panel. But I, I, I'd be sticking with, I'd be sticking with your young guns for the time being because definitely some of the older fellas probably had better championships than most who would have been on panels in previous years. But I think, I think they should stick to their guns now and stick with those younger guys and give them, give them that exposure. You know. Yeah, and what's the realistic expectation then in in twenty twenty three? As you said, is it just being competitive, like obviously trying to solidify defensively, or what do you think? Yeah, like I I know players will always talk about they want to get promoted, they want to get promoted, but like I'm looking at the fixtures there, and you're looking at like Wicklow are going to have a massive bounce from Oshin McConville straight away, even if he doesn't do anything different than any other manager. Just the fact that they have a big personality there they're going to get a huge reaction immediately and um, that's their first game at home like that'll be massive who, who comes out on top there just just to get that just to, as we talked about earlier that confidence to get that confidence momentum going um like leash we haven't beaten leash in god i, I can't even tell you the last time we bet leash competitively Leash have have one over on us you know so there's another massive game at home um leach from sligo like McIntyre still with Sligo there's a bit of consistency there and uh, decent side and then Leach with Andy Moore and I've no doubt will bump up again and I saw Andy was putting another Luke Bree from Vincent's into his management team as well as Sligo man that will add another little layer of experience but it's I, I think it's going to be incredibly tough like Carla were second from bottom last year I think if you are competitive in every game it should get you mid, mid table ish and then if you get a couple of lucky breaks here and there but the big thing I would like them to see is cutting their cloth to measure for winter football, which it is going to be, and from pl for playing teams that are probably going to be a step or two ahead them under ahead of them on kind of the development ladder, you know. Yeah, like and I was going to ask you maybe in terms of like a, a long term aim or a long term project for Carlo. I know it's kind of difficult maybe to see like because uh, as you as you were saying like kind of Carlo have generally sort of always been around division four and obviously had that that year where he's got up to division three like but in terms of a long-term aim could it be to sort of get up to division three solidify there be competitive in the Talchin Cup or what sort of the the thought process yeah I, I like it, these things are these things are very hard to know what like and, and this comes back to our original conversation about when your structures and all the rest of it like what is the aim for what is the aim for counties like ourselves you know and, and i always compare or, or like, like you're looking at the perfect model for a county like us would be for mana who have hmm. you know have been doing incredibly well like you know fighting in division the top end of division two division three kind of in around that sort of standard and, and they'd be very similar kind of to ourselves but it's that's that's taken a massive amount of work and a massive amount of resources for them and i'm just kind of wondering like has there ever been much reward bar a promotion for them in that you know it, it, there probably hasn't and from carlos point of view 
as you say, getting out, if they could hold in Division Three a couple of years, that was the biggest regret for me personally was that we didn't progress from the promotion on. Like we, we kind of probably took our foot off the pedal going into Division Three, which we should have been going the other way. We should, there should have been a realization that now we need actually we need to bump this up a small bit more. Whereas it felt like the mountain the mountain had been climbed by getting out of, getting out of Division Four. I would love to see, as you say, a Carlow team getting out of Division Three and maintaining or getting out of division four and maintaining that spot in division three for a couple of years i think that would be significant progress it would show uh, a development it would show a, a bit of maturity from the group that they're able to recognize well maybe we need to set our bar a little bit higher than just a promotion from division three maybe we need to start feeling like we are from division four sorry we need to start feeling like we belong at a higher level i think that would be huge i think that's a few years away still to be honest um it mightn't even be in nile Crow's time but the groundwork he's putting in at the moment for the next however long he's there, if he's there for a year or two years, that could lay a foundation for if they get a really good manager, really good coach clued in to take that group on to the next level. Yeah, because I suppose you see it with, obviously you mentioned Fermanagh, but you've seen Clare obviously go up into Division 2. Like they'd obviously have a you know more of a traditional hurling background, Tipperary as well. Even Limerick are now up in Division 2 and, you know, they probably would have played yourselves maybe in Division 4 not too long ago. So I suppose like there are examples and there are templates there to follow. Now I know the likes of Limerick, Tipperary, Clare be a much bigger, you know, counties, bigger populations, probably better club championships and everything else. But like that there is sort of the model for for counties like uh, a carlo to follow yeah absolutely absolutely and like there, there are examples and I, I i'd love to see i'd love to see something like uh, like again it comes back to the league being your best competition the league there there, there has been yes limerick got their day out in the monster final but i'm using the phrase a day out which is kind of you'd want, you'd want to get away from that a small bit like i mean uh claire similarly got a got to a couple of monster semi-finals and finals and then you come up against the big dogs and it, it's lights out but i you'd love to see you'd love to see something else i don't know what it is but like i still think your your league promotion is probably the thing you're going to take away with you and and i know that'll be probably my the best thing i can remember from my time is, is getting promoted in the league but um it, it'll be interesting with those like especially limerick to see can they maintain that standard that they had last year and like talking about resources i mean there's a well-resourced county you know that that's definitely improving them you know and and a group of players that are buying into buying into like billy lee put in massive work with them for a couple of years but um and, and with raymond dempsey coming in next year who was a knock more man like that'll be very interesting to see how they get on but um yeah as you say there, there's examples are there and there's examples are are all coming from good league bases and i think that is that is the main thing for carlos moment yeah, and I, and I suppose maybe just some general predictions then, sort of looking into looking into next year. Like, I mean, who, in your opinion, at this moment in time, going into twenty twenty three, would sort of be the the team to beat or the or the strongest team? Like, I think for a lot of people, maybe it's split between Kerry, Dublin, Tyrone, and maybe a few others in there. But what do you reckon? Like, who's the who's the strongest side going into twenty twenty three? Yeah, it's um, it's it's going to be much more interesting this year, I think, than last year. Even I, I think there was. I think there was an acceptance probably Dublin weren't at the standard they were at um, of the previous years and as we said a new manager coming in after such such a, a reign like Jim Gavins is always going to be tough and um, I think Dublin are going to put a massive push on this year I really do uh, you know get, getting um, Jack McCaffrey back Mannion back fit uh, you'd be looking at a, a fully fit con um, Gilroy coming into the background there like you'd love to know what might be the role that he might have um I, I think Dublin Dublin are gonna put a massive squeeze on, on, on this one this year. Um Tyrone then as you as you mentioned, always the year after, two years after they win in All Ireland, they're very dangerous. You know, it's oh three, oh five, you know, to take to take a year off in the middle. That'll be interesting to see how they go. But Kerry, Kerry are still Kerry are still a class act. They really are. I know we're we're forgetting about Galway for the moment, which I am I'm, I'm still not totally sold on Galway yet. But I think it'll come to, it'll come down to I think it'll be Kerry Dublin whatever way that balances out I think you'll probably get a winner from them it, like it's we were talking about inside forwards earlier like I mean the, the the margin between Kerry and Dublin this year was a fit David Clifford and a not fit Con and and they're so important inside forwards like they they can everything just rotates around your 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 kind of your marquee forwards you know and, and there was a time they were disappearing out of the game they were being marked out of games but there seems to be a bit of an evolution. And these guys are having more and more of an influence. And I found it really interesting to see the difference Dublin with Con, let's say, at Leinster final. Uh, I know Kildare probably set up naively, but uh, and then 
Dublin without him during the league when they look kind of rudderless. You know, it's it's it's. I think it's between those two. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Like I think it was it was night and day, sort of watching Dublin this year, sort of with O'Connor O'Callaghan, and then obviously when he's in the side as well. Like I mean, you, you see the the difference he, he really brings to to Dublin. But in terms of any surprise packages or anyone you think could cause one or two upsets, sort of further down the leagues. Yeah, I, I'd be. I'm kind of curious to see uh, how Colm O'Rourke does in Mead. Um, I know he was writing articles recently, and he was saying it was uh, a bit of a shock to the system to see what the actual level or where the level is actually now at the moment, and what he needs for an intercounty setup. Um, I'm very curious to see how that goes. Um, as regards other other teams, uh, Vinnie Corey and Monaghan, I think it'll be that'll be an interesting one to see what happens there. Um, with a, have a friend in school who's who's on the Monaghan panel at the moment, and he's he says really good things about how they're moving and how training is going. So they might be one to keep an eye on. Um, outside of that, like there's nothing. There's going to be nothing majorly. I don't. You don't see any major shocks or anything. You know, Armagh will be floating around there again. Can they repeat what they did last year, or will, will it kind of have knocked the stuff out of them a little bit that lost to Galway? Um, but I think it's. I think it's going to be a good championship. I, I do. I, I still think there is a, a gap between probably Dublin and, and Kerry and the rest. But the rest are nicely competitive there. There's five or six teams that are all in around kind of similar standards. So, But again, this is all about you will have good games in the league and then you're just trying to trudge through a bit of the provincials so we can actually get to the, the real stuff, you know, and, and even the real stuff might not start until the semi-final sometimes. But, you know, so be it. 100%. Well, look, Daniel, much uh, appreciated you jumping on. Um, and yeah, I suppose best of luck for... The new season, everything else, watching uh, watching Carlo. Thanks, Millionaire, appreciate it.